Moore? Here. O'Kane? Here. Shaner? Here. Scott? Here. Waters? Here. Stand for a moment of silent prayer followed by the Pledge of Allegiance. <laughs> to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Evan Schumacher and all kinds of other people. I have a commendation that reads, whereas youth of the year is the highest honor a boys and girls club member can receive. Club members who are, are nominated to body the values of leadership, service, academic excellence, and healthy lifestyles. Teens from clubs throughout the United States compete at a local level and can then move forward to compete against others in the state, regional, and national level. Whereas last year, the youth the local Youth of the Year winner, Brian Regino, went to compete at the state level where he was awarded the title of 2021 Iowa State Youth of the Year. Who's, who's, which one of you is it? Not here, okay. Whereas this year, the Boys and Girls Clubs of Siouxland have four nominees, Heaven Schumacher, Michael Regino, Dalton Belden, Hennessy Topolo, and Leslie Slider. And whereas the Youth of the Year runner-up is Michael Rowino, Ro Regino, and the youth, 22 youth of the year is Heaven Schumacher. Well, congratulations, guys. Now, therefore, I, Robert E. Scott, Mayor of the City of Sioux City, Iowa, on behalf of City Council, deem it an honor to commend and congratulate Heaven, Sch Heaven Schumacher and the other 22 nominees and wish he Heaven the good luck as she goes on to compete at the state level in March of this year. Who's, he who's Heaven? All right. Well, good luck. Good luck to all of you. Thank you. Good luck. Okay, we'll go to interviews for boards and commissions, building and housing code board, Kimberly Weller. We know a little bit about you, but you want to re-up? Yes, this will be my second three-year term. Okay. Excuse me, could you pull the microphone over there? And oh, sorry about that. Yeah, thank you. All right. So have you enjoyed your time there? Yes. Okay. What'd you learn? Uh, it keeps me involved. Um, I was a member of the Home Builders Board, plus uh, worked at Mid American before for 30 years. So it just keeps me involved in the uh, different committee and stuff for the city of Sioux City. Good for you. Questions? Yeah. Thanks for reapplying. You're welcome. All right. Yeah. Thank, Thank you. you. Your service. Appreciate it. Museum Board of Trustees, Dave Somsky. I don't see him, do you? Okay, well, well, if he comes in, we'll do it. Okay. Consent agenda today is items 3 through 14G. Consider them to pass unanimously. If you want to speak on an item, please come up as I read it. State your name and address for the record. If you want to speak on an item not on the agenda, please come up under citizen concerns. I'll move the consent agenda. Second. Three is the reading of the January 24th and 29th City Council minutes. Four is a resolution authorizing staff to nego negotiate with Mission Square Retirement for administrative services for the city's 457 plan. Mike, tell me exactly what this does. I mean, I've got money in that plan. What 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 a, what does the average employee gain by this? So <clears throat> right now we have several providers that employees are able to contribute to. This will narrow it down for everybody has to contribute to Mission Square. I think I'll ask um, finance maybe to speak to this a little bit as far as what we currently offer is pretty unique. Um, we're trying to cut down and save a lot of money in the meantime for the employees. I would save a lot of money for the employees. That's my That's question. That's plans. 
Um, Teresa Fitch, Finance Director. At this time, with the consolidation, they've estimated we'll save about $350,000. The employees will, um, because the cost of each fund will, will be reduced because of the administrative, uh, the amount of funds that we have in the plan. Right now, we have nine different um, administrators that service us with 27 different providers within there. So um, this will kind of put everything in one group and plan that will allow them to get a better pricing for that um, for the different funds that they contribute to and, and or purchase. So in essence, it's going to narrow it down to one administrator? Yep, so which is typical when you look pocket, outside of the city. Um, the reason that our plan is the way it is um, is that the time that we um, developed our 457 plan, the city did not have a match to it. So we didn't have any control over where um, people contributed the funds to. Um, but now that the city has a, has a um, contributing, um, contributes to the plan, we have a um, fiscal responsibility to monitor the plan, the plan at a higher level than we ever have in the past. And unfortunately, with as many providers and funds that we have, we just don't have the ability to monitor every single one of the funds that, that is invested in. You have additional questions? Works out. I do too. I have a resolution Thank you. approving the city's Thank you. request to the IDOT and the Federal Highway Administration to revise the federal function classification map. Six is a resolution scheduling a hearing on a proposed maximum property tax dollars of, of the city. Seven is a resolution of inviting proposals for land in the combined. Floyd River Urban Renewal Area announcing the intent to accept the proposal of Hindhold Hog Markets and scheduling a hearing the property at Cunningham Drive. You base the price by the dollar amount of the property on both sides, right? Jeff Hansen, Community Development Operations Manager. That is correct. It's the average assessed value. In this case, it's assessed as commercial industrial, so it's at 100%. Residential is at 50%. Right, but the prices probably would be higher if you waited for Heinhold to sell out, is all I'm saying. Potentially. Our understanding that Heinhold is selling their facility um, with this alley to feed energy to the south. Right. Feed Energy is not, uh, at least by our policy, not allowed to buy this alley directly from the city because they're not directly adjacent to it at this time. Dan? That the price could be affected depending on when? Yeah, they're going to get a, probably a better deal than what the real land value is. But. Is there a different way to go about it, or should we go about it a different way? I'd Wait until they registered their sale, and then you could sell to feed energy. But I don't know. Probably not that big a deal. I would like to know the numbers after this all goes through, though. I'd like to know what they were. Eight are actions relating to grants and gifts. Say is a resolution approving the city's application to the Surface Transportation Block Grant Program and the Transportation Alternatives Programs. B is a resolution accepting a donation from the Siouxland Community Foundation Bob and Jenny Peterson Foundation Fund for skate helpers at the IBP Ice Center. C is a resolution accepting grant funds from the Iowa Homeland Security and Emergency Management. Nine are civil pen penalties and suspensions. A is a resolution assessing a $500 city civil penalty against, oh boy, Barotas Aguaya for violation of the beer, wine, and liquor license. B is a resolution accepting a $500 civil penalty against Al Tapatio for violation of the beer, wine, and liquor laws. Ten are actions relating to agreements and contracts. Resolution granting a permit to FiberCon to maintain underground cable in the 4th Street corridor. B is a resolution awarding an agreement to KP Construction as the primary contractor for the utilities concrete construction project. C is a resolution awarding an agreement to Concrete Plus as a secondary contractor for utilities concrete construction project. D is a resolution approving a contract to Subsurfco for the South Roy Street Myers Avenue storm sewer repair project. I need to abstain on that item. E is a resolution awarding a contract to Sioux City Engineering for the Stone Park Boulevard reconstruction project. 
F is a resolution approving a contract to LNL builders for the fire rescue training tower project. G is a resolution awarding a surface, surface provider agreement to chem contractors for repairs to the Grandview Park band ship. Eight, go I have ahead. A, I have a question on that one. Well, the total price, there was such a big difference between the two uh, bids that you received. And I like the lower bid, of course, and, and I go to the band shell for lots of events, and w one of the main um, comments, we're going to make many people happy with this, um, because one of the comments was, can we get the repairs made to the to the Grandview Park band shell. <coughs> so I'm very excited to see this, but I just noticed there's such a, a vast difference between the two. Mayor, Council, Kelly Bach, Parks Maintenance, Field Supervisor, and Spiro is here also, went through the bid process with us. Um, yes, there was a vast difference in the concrete, um, the hard surface repairs. We also saw that difference in the request for painting, which you'll see in an upcoming meeting towards the end of the month. Um, those ranged from basically, can I say, 98 to a quarter of a million dollars. Um, so, yes, we did see quite a bit of difference here between the vendors that had bid. Um, going back, we did this project in 2008 also. Uh, we are, and um, it was a different company, same, same manager, and it most likely will be the same painter again. We're in line with those numbers given the f inflation factor. We were about 100, 185 total package in 2008 and we'll be right around 141 right now. So, you know, we're, we're kind of factoring in construction costs and inflation. We're in the ballpark where we were in 2008 also. So I really don't have concerns with the bid difference given the same corporation bid that bid on this bid on the painting and they were about a quarter million dollars to paint so okay uh, and so you said the guy that bid this was with somebody else back in 08 yes western who, who did it last time mcgill western waterproofing is kim the old kim masonry company sure how how the whole has gone but jeff bennington is with them now he was with western waterproofing the window replacement and the concrete uh, repairs that will be done, and the pa the painting is going to be a separate contract. That'll all be completed before the events start up. And we have a 2022 hopeful completion date of June 19, given good weather, and everything will be complete June 19 with everything. W was there any work done after Saturday in the park event? I I had asked about any repairs that were going to be made, and they thought there. Would there was some schedule to be done I like think in July or August of last year. Was that, was there anything? We done were or? looking at it and we've held off and done a complete project. We were looking at the windows as a separate project previously, but we incorporated that all into the concrete repairs because some of those areas have the, the concrete spall as you've seen in the pictures. So we just incorporated all the hard, hard work into one contract. Pictures are very telling. On the painting, are you going with any kind of uh, color scheme? Exactly the same as it is today. White. A little brighter? What, a what? White on white. <laughs> <laughs> It'll have the black stage uh, pedestals, the gray walkways, and bright white, I believe, is the color. Tenemec. Well, thank you for bringing this forward. It'll, it'll really be a huge improvement. Looking forward to it. Thank you. Thank you. That's not much of a cushion on timeline, Kelly. I hope, I hope the weather cooperates, that's for sure. Uh, you, you know me. <laughs> Cut it <But> tight. They, <laughs> I was wondering, why was there such a big gap between the two bids, though? Do we know that? There always is in specialty type. <clears throat> that's a lot of difference. $70,000. Right, $70,000 between. Who was second bidder? McGill. Yeah. Uh, Spiro. Yeah, maybe they're just so busy. Spiro reminded me that Kim also has several local projects going on that are smaller in nature, so 
made sense to add one more, but uh, it would be a little more concerning if the painting was closer, but the company bid higher on this and the painting, so they're just a higher bid process. So. Yeah, it was just a, such a gap between <laughs> large amount. <coughs> Okay. Sure, it'd be great. This project is actually May 15th. Yes, this is May 15th, but then the painting is June 15th. But having these two work together, and they've worked together before, they may overlap into each other. But that would be nice. One nice thing about having contractors that have previously worked together. Sounds good, gentlemen. Thank Certainly you. gets used a lot, so thank you. H is a resolution approving a consulting services agreement with Trail Solutions International Mountain Biking Association for the Cone Mountain Bike Park Project. Exciting stuff, Matt. It is. Eleven. Forward to it. Actions authorizing payments. A is a resolution authorizing payment to J's A Better Restoration for repair at the biogas facility and ancillary building at the wastewater treatment plant. B is a resolution amending. Resolution 2020-0930 for the Military Road Reconstruction and Bridge Rehabilitation Project by adjusting the amounts due and payable. Purchasing for is a resolution, a, or a, I'm sorry, is a resolution awarding a purchase order to Ed Stivers Ford for the purchase of four Ford Police Interceptors all-wheel drive vehicles. B is a resolution awarding a purchase order to Stu Hansen Dodge City Jeep for a Ram 5500 chassis tradesman pickup. C is a resolution awarding a purchase order to Jensen Motor Motors for a Ford 150 4x4 Super Cab pickup. D is a resolution awarding a purchase order to Beersbach Equipment <coughs> Supply for a Godwin CD250M drive prime pump. I'd like to pull that and vote on it. I, there has to be a way to get, when you spec a pump, we need to, if we can't figure out how to spec a pump, I mean, to get a second bid, then we should ask somebody else. We should take the initiative. We shouldn't wait for them to say, well, nobody, nobody came forward, so maybe we won't get another one. But it bothers the heck out of me, all these pumps we buy and never get a, a second bid on one. They reported that they sent out six invitations. But they said, here's the pump. Now, if you want to try to go through the specs and make an... And get it get it approved. Come on, we can we can figure out if there's another pump that works. We don't have to have. We need to find a comparable one to the specs that we give. The, are they too vague? I don't know. They say they they say that people just didn't tell them. Well, why don't we why don't we initiate it? Right, that's my point. Rather than getting one one quote, that's it. Brad Pitts, utilities director. <clears throat> yeah. So the. During any bid, we always specify a manufacturer of a pump, uh, but we do allow alternate bids for a different uh, manufacturer pump. Uh, as Dan pointed out, there were it went to six vendors, none of them provided another bid. So, the explanation as to why they didn't return a bid, or they just we don't typically oh, ask. Yeah. Oh. Uh, but to the mayor's point, if we've only got one bid or feel that we're only getting one bid, uh, we can certainly reach out. To the other vendors to well you do that on construction projects when you only get one bid you say yeah. why, why did we only get one bid i don't know why we don't do it in this stuff get it so anyway call the roll please well do you want to pull it and just call and ask that or you move forward and no you can move forward it's just I, this happens way too often in in the sewer and water plants around shaner <coughs> i <coughs> excuse me scott no waters hi more? Aye. Okay. Aye. 13 are applications for beer and liquor license. See the list come forward if you have questions. 14 is receipt of minutes. See the list come forward if you have questions. Anyone to be heard on any of those items? My name is Rick Wassel. I live at uh, 3251 Stone Park Boulevard, and that is right at the intersection of Stone Park Boulevard and Clifton. And I would like to address the Sioux City Engineering um, contract. Is this the time to do that right now? Yeah. yeah I can do that? Okay. Um, the first thing I'd like to say is I, this is the second half of the con 
This is the second part of this contract. The first part was behind my house uh, from Clifton, that intersection right there all the way down to Briarcliff. The second part is gonna be in front of my house, uh, a one, one house down, from there all the way down to Broken Kettle. Uh, the first thing I'd like to say is if I would invite all of you to come to my house, come to that intersection, park your car, and get out and walk around my property and walk it straight down to Briarcliff. When you turn around my property, the first thing you are gonna notice is every piece of sidewalk is undulating. There are trip points all the way down from my house all the way to Briarcliff, and it is tilting back towards the property. They built a retaining wall. It is only three feet high, and within six months, that retaining wall started to settle, pitch forward, and you can stand there and look at it. It undulates up and down, sideways, and it is several degrees forward. And the sidewalks are now settling into the retaining wall. Directly behind my house, there they have tore out the street panel three times. It has settled because there is a low spot and it does not drain to the sewer line. So this, I don't, I'm not sure who did it, the city, probably Sioux City Engineering came and they've cut it out three times. When you look at the curbing all the way up and down these streets, the curbing undulates and it is all over the place. And from my chair, the work is mediocre at best. I contacted Sioux City, the city's engineering department. I've sent them pictures. I started right away saying, hey, there's a problem here with quality. This is tax money from the Sioux City people, and the quality of work is not there. Now we're getting ready to award a contract to the company that did this work, and I guess my concern would be that we're not setting the standard out here that this work needs to look like this. And if there's any doubt about that work, if you go look at that, if you go look at that work they've already done, turn on to Myrtle Street, which was just finished this summer, and just compare the work that was done on Myrtle to what the work was done on Clifton. So I guess I'm sitting here, I'm not really sure what you can do at this point. I would, personally, I'm thinking, you've got all this equipment in here, why don't you come back and fix the retaining wall and the sidewalks and everything that isn't up to par, and then let's set a standard up here and make these people meet that standard. Okay, let's, let's what's going on, Gordon? It's just a minute, are we on item 10E? <coughs> Stone Park, 10E. Yes, yes, Gordon? Ten, yeah. yes I am. Ten e. Oh, <laughs> Rick, <laughs> nice to meet you, sir. Yes. Oh. <coughs> this, is, this is, I'm sorry, another neighbor that's on, the, strip, on the street. I can verify everything that Rick is saying. That's I fine. Like, well, I'm trying to figure out why we haven't done anything about it. And you got to give your name and address. If yeah. You. Schultz, 3254 Lindenwood. I live directly across the street from Rick on Lindenwood. It was, anyway. No, you're good. Now we'll let Gordon. I'm verifying everything he said. Um, there, I walked my dog down Clifton from Stone Park Boulevard to the trailhead and there are tripping hazards along their safety issues. I was in construction my whole life. We would have never gotten away with that uh, in, on my projects. And uh, I know for a fact that there was no um, compaction testing done under sidewalks. Um, Olson engineering engineer told me, we don't test sidewalks. We don't test under sidewalks. You've got differential from a driveway to a sidewalk as much as two inches. And this stuff is how many years old? I think it was done in 16. I believe 16 is correct. Gordon Fair, city engineer. Okay. We'll let him respond to it a little bit. No longer. Uh, we will look into that. Um, that is an old project that was done, well, like we said, 2016-ish, give or take a year or so. Uh, Sioux City Engineering did do that reconstruction in that area. Okay. So how did it get, if this has been a problem with these guys though, how is it that we let it get out of the warranty period of two years? Uh, to be honest with you, I don't know. That was before my time. I can look into that. How long have you been here now? Uh, since, well, basically the first of 2018. Okay. Well, it sounds like this has been a problem for a long time. Uh, yes. This, this the, within six months, 
the retaining wall started to settle. And the gentleman who built the retaining wall, I had a conversation with him that was with Sioux City Engineering Company, and I said, hey, blah, blah. he told me, I've never built a retaining wall, this is the first one, and I just went, oh, this is not gonna be good. <laughs> I've, uh, since then, subsequently, I've had two different uh, uh, construction companies look at this and say, hey, what, what can be done here? Because this is not gonna get better. I don't know at what point it's, uh, I don't know if it'll pitch over, I, I'm not really sure, but it, it's not getting better, and both companies said, you're, there's no fixing here. Tear the yeah. wall, and it's not, it's not a large wall. Th they said tear the wall out, you can tear the street out. I talked to him about maybe jacking the sidewalks. I don't know. I really don't know what the answer is. Well, let's get an answer here and let's get one real fast. Yep. All yep. right. Yeah. Hey, Rick, what's Give him your number before you guys leave, okay? Yeah, what is your number? Hey, Rick, what's your address again? Mine? Yes. Is 3251 Stone Park Boulevard. Hey, I you. sit right at, when you come down Stone Park, where Clifton and Stone Park split, and one goes straight to Briarcliff, and one goes like you're going out of town, mm -hmm. I am the brick house right, right. there. So okay. I was kind of at ground zero with that whole project. Okay. Thank Rick, you. now was this retaining wall built at the same time the project? At yeah. Yes, ma'am. The well, they, what they did is they widened the street and widened the sidewalk, so they, they put that wall in. They bit into the property, and it, it left it a straight embankment of maybe two feet or three feet. And was and it like that immediately after the project? or Within within months. Within months. So and the thaw freeze I process has nothing to do with that? Pardon me, ma'am. So our thaw freeze process here in no, the U.S. had no, nothing this, to do with it? Within the first year, I've hauled in two, probably like two yards of, of dirt because it was the sinkholes behind the wall it, there were holes all up and down the side, and I was said, you know, I'm just the type, I'm gonna fix it myself. So I was hauling in dirt and packing. Now there is a sinkhole between the wall and the sidewalk where it's pitched back, and it's yay wide, so you know, I don't know how deep it is, but it's, it's an erosion problem. All right. All right. Okay. Thank you. Let's, we'll let's, follow up. We'll try Thank to get you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Appointments to boards and commissions and committees, motion of down. Oh. We are Ideas. still waiting Ideas. for Councilman O'Kane to vote on the <clears throat> consent agenda. Excuse me. Passes 5-0. 15 is a motion appointing Anthony Frabel to the Gilliam <coughs> Kosovo <coughs> Sister City Committee. I'll move that. Passes 5016. A motion reappointing Rick Samuelson to the Gillian Kosovo Sister City Committee. I'll move it. Second. Passes 5017. A motion appointing Daniel Strahan to the Parks and Recreation Advisory Board. I'll move it. Second. <clears throat> Passes 5018, a recommendation of the Planning and Zoning motion accepting the Planning and Zoning Commission's approval of the proposed FY2327 capital improvement program regarding the conformance of proposed projects to the comprehensive plan. I'll move that. Second. Hey, Jeff. We've had, on the Sioux City Comprehensive Plan, we've had several amendments to that since August 30, 2005, haven't we? Jeff Hansen, Community Development Operations Manager. Yes, we've had amendments done to it to approve corridor plans, specific corridor plans, such as the Pierce Corridor Plan and the Hamilton Corridor Plan. When do we do a, a complete update? Of the the comp complete update was done, is, uh, is currently being done, as you recall. We've had several public meetings. Uh, it's a matter of having that approved through PNZ and Council. And so at this time, the only approved comprehensive plan we have is from 2005. We anticipate the other one will be coming up this year? Yes. Including? Okay. Correct. Okay. Thank you. Yep. Do you have a time frame for when the, the current studies are going to wrap? 
It was stalled uh, during the pandemic with public meetings and such. Uh, it's just a matter of bringing it back forward, uh, hosting potentially at least one, maybe two more public meetings and bringing it forward for approval. So I would say with Dan's schedule that he is proposing sometime summer, late summer, early fall. Dave, you gonna come up and real quick, we'll sneak you in and sneak you out here. Yep. You wanna serve again? Yes, please. Okay. Questions for Dave for the museum board? I had one thing. Let me just get back up to my notes here. So I was a little thrown off because under skills and training, you said none but you were an educator for 31 years, which seems like a pretty big skill to gloss over. Well, I didn't know what to say for <clears throat> being on the museum board. Um, the, yeah, being a teacher, I would imagine I would look on that from your position. Um, and I've served on the board this last term and I, really have enjoyed it and I was saved by Alex today. <laughs> I just figured I didn't want you to miss out, buddy. No, and I had three different things going on. It's, oh. but Thank yes, you. I'd love to. Thank you for reapplying, <clears throat> I appreciate your work. Oh, thank you. Thank you. All right, Thanks. thank you, have a good one. Thank you. Yeah. I read that. No, oh, Pat five zero. It hadn't come up, but okay. Nineteen is a hearing and resolution withdrawing the fifteen hundred dollars civil penalty and a thirty day suspension against V I E Sig and Vape Lounge for violation of the liquor cigarette laws. I'll move that. Second. Hearings open. Anyone to be heard? Seeing none, the hearing is closed. Passes 5020 is a hearing and resolution approving a proposal to sell property at 310 Kings Highway and authorizing a deed to petitioners Joseph and Catherine Barnes. I'll move that. Second. Hearing is now open. Is anyone to be heard? Seeing none, the hearing is closed. Passes 5 -0. 21 is a hearing and resolution approving a proposal to sell property at 3010 Panama Street and authorizing a deed. Petitioner John and Patricia Gunya, I'll move that. Second. Hearing's now open. Would anyone like to be heard? Seeing none, the hearing is closed. Passes 5022 is a hearing resolution approving a proposal to sell property at 304 Kings Highway and authorizing a deed. Petitioners Donald and Carrie Klingberg. Borg, I'll move it. Second. Hearing is now open. Anyone to be heard? Seeing none, the hearing is closed. 23 is an ordinance amending chapter. Oh, I'm sorry. Five zero. Twenty three is an ordinance amending chapter <clears throat> two point four six municipal code the Sioux City Environmental Advisory Board to expand membership to an employee of a business within Sioux City who resides either inside or outside the city limits con first consideration approved January twenty fourth, twenty twenty two. Somebody else had to move that one. Okay. Second. I think in the future you guys should consider having a limitation of how many out of town it, members you should have it's a how many um, he said that a majority has to be within city limits well then let's make it a number let's make it a yeah. flat but number it doesn't it doesn't state out of state it says city limits right uh roger bentz uh environmental services it does state five that need to be within city limits and four yeah there. see i'm not for though I'm, I'm, so that's fine. I'll, that's fine. Uh, the rest of them could be for that. That's What's the many number you would like? 
I don't, I don't think you need more than two. I mean, the problem is you have commissions. I told you one, and I don't want to say it here, yeah, but yeah. that we have less Sioux City citizens than we do non-Sioux City citizens. And they're very good board members, but I'm, and the other thing is, I'm gonna tell you, tonight's garbage night at my house. Okay. These guys have <laughs> got to quit just throwing garbage cans wherever they feel like it. I'm getting more complaints on that than any one thing. I drove Military Road last Monday. It looked like a bomb went off the whole way. There were more garbage cans on the ground and in the street than there were on the curb and standing I, up. And I followed, that, I followed up with that right away and it, well, what, what is there, what are they doing? Did they, they had to change the way they're paying these guys that they're in that big a hurry, that they don't. That, that observation, honestly, um, looked like wind aided to me. I picked up four The wind cans. was out of the north and my garbage can was laying on the south, laying, had been tipped from the south. And in military road, they were laying on both sides the same way. So that, we'll see. Okay, tomorrow. Okay. I'll okay. drive military road again on my way to work tomorrow morning and see. I'll follow you. All right. Okay, thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Passes uh, three to two. We'll do third reading next week. Sioux City bike lane study. First Mansion Planner, uh, Simcoe is contracted with RDG Planning Design to prepare a Sioux City bike lane study. Uh, that bike lane study would be a planning document that would guide investments on bicycle lane priorities, cost, and phasing. Uh, that would include recommendations for on-street uh, bikeways, bike boulevards, bike lanes, and trails. Uh, the city's Active Transportation Advisory Committee has been serving as the steering committee for this uh, study. So with that, I'd like to welcome back uh, Charlie Cowell uh, with RDG uh, Planning and Design, and he'll go over uh, that study. Charlie, good to have you back in Sioux City, man. It's always a pleasure. I get back pretty frequently, so but good to be in council chambers again um, no and good to see everyone as Chris said uh, we've been uh, working on this study last summer through the fall uh, with with Simco city staff and the active transportation advisory committee um, just want to go over some of the highlights today and and take time to answer any questions I know a lot of concepts in there are new uh, things that that perhaps uh, you haven't seen before and so would like to, to ask answer any questions you do have um, oh, there we go uh, like I mentioned, this was ongoing uh, through last summer into the fall. Uh, we we kind of worked on a pretty accelerated schedule here uh, with some public input in the, the summer months and survey we'll go over, um, and also uh, a lot of uh, detailed route segment analysis on our bikes and, and cars looking around. Um, there are really uh, uh, many goals to this, this study. Uh, one is just identifying feasible routes uh, for bike facilities uh, in Sioux City, and, and I will differentiate between uh, bike lanes and bike facilities. Uh, we actually call this a bike facility study because um, there's more than just bike lanes uh, to the system. Uh, bike lanes are only one portion of what we would consider a safe, uh, active, on-street bicycle uh, route system. So, um, but the main uh, thing we heard throughout this process and when, when speaking with people as well is, um, I'm going the wrong direction here, is, uh, People are very appreciative of the trail system, the improvements that have been happening over uh, the past several years, um, the connectivity of those trail links, but there's, there's starting now to be that next level of concern of how do we get from our neighborhood or our house uh, to a trail safely uh, so we don't have to drive to the trailhead uh, to access that trail. So um, we heard a lot of that in our survey about um, uh, folks wanting a safe way to get get there without jumping in their car. So that's part of it. The other part is obviously uh, just creating safe environments for those that do uh, actively commute for transportation, whether that be to work or to destinations, or those that want to uh, and would, like, would do it if there were safer options uh, to do that in Sioux City. Um, and then there's other, obviously, economic development related things too. Uh, bike lanes are, uh, and seeing that visibly coming through town as a visitor is, uh, creates an impression of an active transportation friendly community and, and those sorts of things as well. Um, so we did a lot of that existing conditions analysis building on the, the plan that was done in 2015 uh, with the students from the University of Iowa um, and expanded that uh, with kind of current information. Um, and then really dove right into what we were hearing from our survey responses. Um, as I mentioned, 
Uh, most people that responded to the survey were regular trail users. Uh, they really liked, enjoyed the trail. They use it for exercise, working out, taking short trips or bicycle touring around town. Um, and they really thought good bicycle access was important to those trails and to city parks and schools and those sorts of things. So not surprising, uh, you know, that's, that's commonly what we hear everywhere we go. So it wasn't really surprising to us. Um, also, what wasn't really surprising was uh, folks really felt that the most effective routes were those that were most separated from traffic. So trails are the gold standard. Uh, side paths are kind of follow up with that where side path would be a 10-foot path on the side of a maybe an arterial collector street. And then it kind of goes down from there. Uh, buffered bike lanes uh, where there's a thick, thick line on the street uh, against traffic or, or routes that um, are more separated, people were more favorable towards and that showed in our, in our survey as well. Um, and again, not surprising, we, I mean, it's something we hear everywhere. We do understand that, that the facilities that we showed in the survey are not ever gonna be comfortable for everyone. Um, for example, people with kids or families might never be comfortable riding on a bike lane, and, and that's fine, uh, riding on the street. Um, and that's where the more experienced cyclists and the commuters, uh, where they find uh, using those lanes more conducive for their environment, because they prefer to be off the side path, perhaps, where there's more pedestrian traffic and um, chances to crash into people and that sort of thing if they're going at higher speeds. Um, so kind of taking that all into, uh, into account, working with our committee, we really tried to identify what are those priority routes in the city uh, for on-street networks. We, we ignored kind of the side path and trail system because we know there's a lot of stuff already planned in that realm. There's, the system is continuing to build out. So we focused strictly on on-street facilities. Um, and so we looked uh, at Existing streets today that would reach trailheads, that would reach major destinations that are wide enough to be able to accommodate maybe uh, of facilities, um, routes that would not lead to dead ends, uh, could be used over time uh, to create connectivity between different routes, and then obviously um, efficiency, so uh, implementation and cost factors as well played into identifying these routes. And so the, the route you see on the screen and you see in your plans is really uh, what we and our committee felt was the highest level of connectivity for an on-street network to connect to the trail system and destinations. Um, and really, the, I mentioned the feasibility of, of doing actual facilities to make those routes safer uh, for riding your bike on the street. Um, so whether that's the width of the street, whether that's uh, the pavement condition or the, the ability of uh, that route to be reconstructed over time, um, and then actually the traffic volume as well. So there's a balancing act between low volume streets uh, and the directness to des destinations. So trying to balance uh, avoiding the highest traffic streets, but also trying to be the most direct in the route, uh, the routes to get places. So um, we, and just as an example, as you see in the plan, we, we've identified each of those routes, the reasons why we think that uh, we think this route's an important to include bicycle facilities on the destinations it serves, and then uh, any barriers such as, uh, in this instance, on Military Road, obviously the railroad crossing, um, there's some tough intersections there on a few areas that, that would need uh, probably some enhancement, enhanced crosswalks and things to uh, notify um, motorists of, of activity. And so that's detailed out for, for each route. One thing to note, uh, we're going concurrently with this plan on the downtown transportation plan. So, we didn't get into a lot of detail into the downtown environment on purpose because it's already kind of in that downtown transportation plan. So we do call it out in here, but uh, don't go into detail on, on those recommendations. We do reference that, um, that other plan. And then understanding, you know, what are the uh, importance of each of these routes, which ones should happen first uh, to create the greatest benefit and connectivity. Um, <coughs> and then obviously thinking about cost efficiencies as well. And this is an exercise we did with our committee to try to um, identify what are the highest priority routes and uh, perhaps those that could wait a little longer down the line um, and still provide benefit. And so we came out with uh, uh, three levels, high, medium, uh, low priorities. And high priorities, you can see highlighted here. Um, I will say this, this, this high priority system uh, shown here would be a major accomplishment if this was the only thing done. I, it, it has, these, these routes have great connectivity to the trails. Uh, they're, they're continuous routes in general where you can generally hop on one of these streets and stay on that street till you get to your destination or trailhead. Um, 
the facilities are, are relatively easier to, to do on these streets, whether that's painting or there's no street expansions necessary. One thing with all of these things is we, we tried to do is to not change the existing travel environment at all. So if there's parking on the street, we tried to, we retained parking on that street and worked around that um, consideration. If, if the street was a certain width, we worked around that to make sure we were trying not to widen a street um, to make facilities work. So, so these routes provide that uh, in, a, in a pretty good context uh, for high, high importance. The medium uh, routes are moderate priority <coughs> routes. These are more uh, intermediate connection points uh, between maybe our higher priority routes or routes that maybe just aren't gonna be traveled as much by cyclists on the street, um, but do provide a, a service for connecting neighborhoods or making uh, more connections between the higher priority routes. And then the lowest uh, priority are kind of the final um, icing on the cake items that would uh, help again reach uh, <coughs> maybe lower, uh, lower visited destinations or just uh, connections that would benefit uh, neighborhoods um, but aren't maybe, wouldn't be super late, high used perhaps um, in, in the system but would obviously increase safety and, and comfort of, of bicyclists. In the low priority streets, the, would there be some that need to be widened? Yeah, so some of the <coughs> widened, we do have some where we've uh, recommended, for example, uh, um, well, I'll actually go back a slide. Um, Stone Park Boulevard, we've actually provided like two examples. One would be a, a, a paved shoulder, which would include uh, widening or paving, widening the, the shoulder from gravel to pavement. Um, the ideal scenario there would be a, a, side, a side path, so actually a separated path that would get people up to um, Stone Park. That's obviously a huge investment, but um, that's the kind of, uh, but no, we don't uh, actually have widening streets in any of these. We do have some extended uh, uh, pavement, uh, uh, what am I, uh, paved shoulders, sorry, that's the word I'm looking for, paved shoulders, paved shoulders. or side paths, but not actually extending um, the street, so. Which that would be pretty sweet, Matt and Charlie, thinking about that going from the Perry Creek Trail over to Stone Park, all the way to Stone Park. I mean, that obviously you would have to expand and that would be a significant investment, but that's, I mean, because Perry Creek Trail, you're connected all the way down to the riverfront and more, and if you go all the way up, to right there, you know, and then cut over. That's a pretty sweet connection. Yeah, and that and that's a good point. And I didn't mention, um, you know, a lot of these routes are already used by experienced cyclists. Um, you know, like the route we just were just talking about. A lot of people ride that. Uh, experienced cyclists ride that route for for exercise and, and recreation. And and adding those other safety features might open it up to others that maybe aren't quite as comfortable being on Stone Park Boulevard by themselves without something separating them, but maybe would open up that opportunity. Um, other, another example is Whispering Creek, so get it, Whispering Creek Drive. Um, right now there's sidewalks and um, pretty good pavement over there, but um, if you're riding your bike on the sidewalk, you're gonna run into strollers and people walking, so maybe um, that's an opportunity for a side path uh, where we make that a 10-foot path to get from Whispering Creek over um, east and west. So, so there's examples like that, that there's kind of intermediary uh, alternatives and then there's the longer-term investment options as well. What's your typical width of a sidewalk so that you could coexist with walkers and? Uh, well, the recommendation is uh, 10 to 12 feet for if you're intending uh, cyclists to also use that path, yeah. Yep. Is Whispering Creek moderate? That is, yes, I believe. Actually, I believe that is on our high, nope. Yes, higher priority. So. Where would you run it from where to where? Uh, just kind of right now where the end point is, kind of at the turn point uh, into um, kind of the main neighborhood there, because we know there's oh. roads being built <laughs> uh, still over in that area, to the bridge, uh, Highway 20, the bypass um, bridge, and then cutting up uh, Morningside Avenue and, and over. So there's a little bit of challenge at the bridge, and then going northwest up Morningside, there's not a lot of space there for, um, we're actually not recommending side pass in that section, but I think, uh, uh, shared use paths or those types of things. That would be nice. But it, gets, would, it gets a little traction and it's, yeah, just beautiful views the farther you take it that way, yeah. Yep. You're gonna tear up a bunch of Whispering Creek, you ought to seriously consider looking at those plans and. Mm hmm cause that's coming. Yeah. You don't have to convince me to enlarge the sidewalk on your road. Yeah, and that's, and that's the tricky part about this is we show those kind of connecting lines um, 
between the two points, but the street conditions as we move along change. So at some points we're going on the same street and the width changes uh, and parking situations change and- uh, No parking on Whispering Creek. There isn't any reason you can't put a bike trail in there. Yeah, no, we don't, yeah, we don't disagree with that. Um, it was- uh, Oh, the traffic down. Yep. So the plan does call out those situations. It provides the context for each street segment and, and where recommended changes in uh, the facility type would be. Um, so if on um, that section of Whispering Creek, if it would, uh, a bike lane would be the preferred alternative, then it's just switching out that segment from you know the side path and <coughs> the, the bike lane investment for that part of the segment. And so there's several types of facilities in the study uh, based on the context and comfort level. Um, I'm not gonna dwell on these too much because uh, they're very specific context-oriented uh, situations. But uh, as I mentioned, it does vary where we want to maintain non-street parking uh, and where um, we wanna maintain street widths and, and still provide that separation from traffic if possible. Next phase that you should be trying to get grants for is we own all the old railroad right-of-way south of Whispering Creek that runs around to Fleet Farm, and you should connect that, and then it connect and come up the other way. Matt knows what you're referring to. And that could be part of the rails to the trails? Yeah, it's a, it's a perfect nice. trail bed because it's an old railroad track. Well, and they have those grants, right? Yeah. And it wouldn't be very far to then connect to the Koskovich and those guys' project either. That was for Parks and Recreation Director. Yeah, that would connect into Fleet Farm, Christie Road, right. which then in, in turn could uh, connect to Singing Hills. And then you can take Singing Hills all the way out to Railroad Museum. So be a very key connection. You have all of Whispering Creek connected if you go down south and talk real nice to the golf course, we might be able to make a deal. Be the first time somebody from the city talk nice to the golf course, maybe you could be the first guy to get that done for us. That sounds like a challenge, Matt. Yeah, well, every other time they've held a gun to our head and said, we're running the sewer line through your property whether you like it or not, so. Which is where the bed for that road is, is where the sewer line runs, so you just go by that sewer line. All right, what else? <laughs> Well, though, I was just, uh, uh, um, some of the facilities in the system, you know, as we talk, you know, we're recommending various things in here and giving you the context and tools, and we understand that situations might change where a different facility type may be needed to use if a road's gonna be reconstructed or whatever. So um, we provide those options in here between, you know, things like Sharrows, which are basically shared street markings uh, using your existing kind of on-street signage that you have for the bike routes. Your traditional bike lane, which I said, it, which is, um, again, um, kind of what most people think of when they think of uh, bike lanes. Uh, there's going to be situations where we recommend in the plan a bike lane, but also a share combination. So there are areas where there's steep hills where a cyclist will be going slower up the hill, so that protected bike lane is, is a safety feature for them. But then going downhill, the speeds are fast enough where a bicyclist could take the whole lane because um, they'd be traveling up, uh, in line with vehicles. Another situation would be where we want to preserve parking, so we keep parking on both sides, and maybe we fit a bike lane on one side and a uh, Cheryl on the other side, so the bike lane maybe would be on the steeper end, the going uphill um, portion, uh, and the Cheryl on the downhill portion. Um, so those are just some examples of kind of the facilities that we, you know, we show in the study and, and where those are applied to in the different contexts. Um, implementing the system, obviously there, there's a lot of, uh, a lot of uh, ideas here to think about and, and how these get um, completed over time. Uh, so you, the high, moderate, low priority options are, are based on several criteria that we worked with our committee on, why those are high, medium, and, pro, and low, and one of those was implement, implementation uh, feasibility. Um, so uh, in here, we split this out into an example kind of a program for implementation. Um, and the costs in there, are, are, I want to note, are if we were doing nothing else, if we were just doing this project. So there's, there's ways to <coughs> efficiencies uh, if there's already a street reconstruction going on where um, the equipment's mobilized and, and we can do the paint or do the 
do the facility with that project. It, it's the cost of, of various things. So I mentioned that uh, kind of first system of implementing uh, the, a loop system here for kind of phase one. Um, phase two, making more connection, uh, connections uh, to those phase ones, uh, phase one implementation. These are somewhat interchangeable, so if an opportunity arises to do a phase two option in phase one, that makes that save money or, or make a critical connection, that this is a, a flexible imp implementation schedule. And then the last phase is kind of wrapping up the, the system on um, making those final connection points. The idea, the one idea and important concept uh, when planning out these projects is um, one uh, is is making sure that we're not creating dead ends so if we implement a project it should be it should end somewhere logical like a park or a another bike lane or a trail um, that's uh, it doesn't it, it it brings confidence to the user that they've they're doing something right and if they end up at a, a dead end it's kind of I did something wrong and then they lose Faith in the system. So you're either connecting or arriving. Yep. You're doing something. Yep. And so they lose confidence and get discouraged from using it again, uh, basically. And and so there's some educational components to this as well. Um, these are obviously new concepts for both cyclists and motorists. Um, so so when unveiling uh, these new things, there's there's educational campaigns that can be done, and we provide a list here of those. And and there's other cities that are doing similar pilot project type things. The, make people aware of them before they actually do the, the implementation of the full project. Um, and then monitoring over time, you know, there's, there's gonna, the cyclists are gonna know best what's working, what's not, so if there's a way for them to report concerns on an online map or something, uh, and then you can, if you're seeing a common concern, then maybe that facility needs to be a, a adjusted a little bit, uh, whether it's an intersection or a, 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 a driveway that's causing trouble or, or things like that. And then lastly, maintenance. Uh, it really can't be understated how important maintenance of the system is. Um, not just refreshing the paint and making sure the paint's visible um, by using high quality uh, materials on that, but also keeping the lanes, if it is a bike lane, free from potholes, just like you would on a normal street, um, free from debris, um, and making it as safe as possible, uh, just like you would for your trails. Um, you can really consider this as part of the whole system, so. When we paint the streets, we use th latex, Dave, or thermoplastic. Right. Yeah, that's why we do them every year around. I was going to say we were told there weren't other options, right? Because we've talked about that. Because, Charlie, one of the things we've talked about is just the additional cost of painting. I mean, it's, it's really a, a blow to the budget to not only have these, but then update and make sure that they're looking nice and visible, highly visible. Use a, a waterborne high uh, high build paint, so we don't use the lowest quality paint. But you can get into thermal plastics and all that. But a lot of that is better off if you grind down the pavement and actually put it in a recess, and that gets real cost prohibitive at times. Well, you're redoing. This is my vote. The rest of you can have your say here when I get done and ask if you want to. But we're redoing the streets on. Whispering Creek this year. Well, this is the time when we redo one, my opinion, that we look at what they're proposing here before we just go out and bid it like we always do around here. Well, we are widening that to 31 to match the rest of the street because for some reason that section was only 27. What? We're widening it to 31 to match the rest of the street because it's only 27 through there. Dave, where was the starting point on this section? Uh, uh, that's from Castles Gate to Nicholas Drive, I believe. That's further what, east. Yeah. Because it's wide coming in. This is this is the section that's down at the bottom of the hill where Castles Gate. Right, Castles Gate, and then it goes up part the next, right. to the right. next well, stop When you sign. come down the hill, you're okay. It's 30-some feet there, isn't it? I don't know off the top of my head. I know the section we're looking at is 27. We're going to 31. But even 31, Charlie, what would you recommend on a on-street bike lane for width? Yeah, so um, so if you have 11 or 12-foot vehicle travel lanes, the plus uh, six-foot width for the bicycle lane, um, plus the painting width as well uh, and gutter. But six foot on each side. Yeah, so you'd be around 31. Yeah. No. Or 30. You're up to 37. 37. Yeah. Well, okay. Do what he said. Look at. 
Let's don't Chair. let's don't right away say no. Let's say no. I'm just explaining it. I'm and I'm explaining. You can go down the hill. On the roadway. On the roadway and the other lane, but you and could at least up. get one road one. You got people out there driving golf carts all over the place. I see it every time I go out on sidewalks. We don't say anything to them, which is fine. I'm glad we don't. Don't tell the city attorney that lives out there. She should be concerned because she won't let anybody drive a four wheel in our town, even though Lawton and Lamar's and Mobile all have that going on. So anyway. I'll happily take any direction the council has <laughs> yeah. to add that. <laughs> but those sidewalks out there are already at least five or six feet wide. Five footers. Okay, in the new parts, why aren't we requiring seven or eight feet on both sides then? When they open up a new subdivision, we're gonna open up Glen Allen Road here real quick. Why don't we require that? Because you're gonna be able to hook up, when you get done here, if we do it right, you'll be able to hook up Glen Allen Road up to Highway 20. Why don't we start doing that today rather than, I mean, I know you guys don't wanna do it, but I don't well, understand. You can give us direction, whatever well, direction you'd like. I, I, that's the first time someone's ever asked that. Well, that we've asked about some that. of these streets, what we can do, and what we do is we design them the exact same way with no painting for bikes or anything. We finally got conduit going in the ground. It's time we begin before we do a street. You know, we just did Stone Park Boulevard. We're talking about taking people up to Stone Park. Why are we not putting 10 foot, a 10 foot sidewalk in on that project? That's, those are the things that people are asking. We'll go back and we'll tear something up and do it again two or three years from now, which makes no sense. We're well, willing to do whatever you would like us to do. Yeah, as long as you have We're the trying to get as many miles done as the low cost as we can. That's, that's the problem. But the, the problem is low cost at the end of the day is not low cost when you have to go back and uh, do things. I totally agree with you. So, I mean, are we widening the street enough that at least we can put bike lanes and painted bike lanes on Stone Park Boulevard? Nobody parks on it anyway. Check that. I'd like you to not give the contract to Saul's back until we have answers for that, at least so we know. We oh. Seems like a logical place for a bike lane, since that's one of the- Yeah, at least, let's at least like see that. what- well, if, yeah. if we're gonna add a bike lane, we'll have to cancel the contract because it'll have to go all through DOT letting. If you want to change the, the pavement width and all that, we'll have to go back through DOT let. That was a DOT letting. That's a DOT letting. So that's you why start all yeah. the way back over the. Problem. That's why we couldn't get the engineer's estimate, isn't it? What? That's why we couldn't have the engineer's estimate. It was because it was a DOT bid project. Charlie, are you completed on your study? Yeah, yeah, yeah. We um, heard just that. Questions. Um, that particular section of uh, West Clifton at, at uh, connecting to Stone Park, we had around a 24 foot width and we had identified shared lane markings on that small segment. It's a pretty small segment to, and then get up to Stone Park. Um, yeah, the reason why I'm asking you is, is I think you've done an excellent job on this study and it's exactly what I've been looking for and I, and I can use what I'm concerned about and what I wanna make sure we do as a council, and the mayor's touched on this a little bit, was how can we coordinate with Matt and other departments so that we'll always have this study in front of us and it doesn't go by the wayside and we forget or it's not a priority. But I like your list of priorities because they're all gonna require funding of one or another and it would be nice if we could, um, we always try in this community to spread things out into to the different parts of town and that there's no exception here either. You know, to, we have to make sure everybody gets some of the bike trails and bike paths. So if there's some way we can keep this in front of us at all times and in front of you, Matt, and in front of Dave and others, that's what we really, that's what we really need to do to make this work and implement it. And I'm, and I'm glad you're doing the educational program to safety because I looked at the reports on two fatal the two fatalities we had in the past 11 years, and um, you know it was distracted driving. I mean, they're trying to do whatever they're doing and distracted, and they don't see the person on the bike or they don't see the person walking across the street. So the safety feature of it's going to be extremely important, as you as yeah. you've acknowledged. Yeah, we can't stress enough, you know, trails are still the gold standard. Um, even an experienced cyclist, if they had a choice, I, I'm sure most, if not all, would choose a trail over a bike lane if they're relatively close and going to the same destination. But um, yeah, but bike lanes serve a purpose too. And um, 
making those critical gaps work. Yep. So where I am technology, I'd like to get a hard copy of this too. <laughs> Keep it in front of me. Yeah, the techno guy. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I just, yeah, I like the copy. That's why you got like 600 it. pages and the rest of us read it on our oh, computer. Gosh. That's how technical you are. I thought you wanted to get out of here at the, <laughs> for He's the gonna meeting. Talk. Just say it. Charlie, I appreciate it very much. Yeah, I've, this was so informative. I've been a bit, as some of you in the back know, I've been a big advocate for bike lanes for quite some time. I think they keep people like you in our community rather than watching you move to Des Moines, but I understand that was other stuff, man. But I think, that last night too. To, I think to keep Mike. moving forward, to keep attracting and retaining <coughs> um, different and diverse populations, I think that we need to do everything that we can. And to the mayor's point, when we're updating some of these streets and doing that, it only makes sense to implement them. I mean, I understand the need for a comprehensive plan, um, that that's important. I think some of these are no brainers. I mean, you look at Jackson, look at, what we did on Morningside Avenue, I mean, these are these are not head scratchers, So, but I appreciate you at least laying it out um, so that hopefully we have clear direction. And to Dave Carney's point, I think that we just make sure that we give staff direction because he's trying to make sure that our roads are not hundreds of years old and trying to pave as many miles as possible rather than adding hundreds of thousands of dollars you know, when you look at width, he's looking at how far can we go, not all the amenities that we can add. So without council direction, surely he's not gonna do that. So we just need to make sure that we're all coordinating these departments to implement something like this. One, one last thing that I would say is I do appreciate, um, especially your high priority. I mean, if you go back to that slide, you don't have to, but if you go back to that slide, I just thought it was pretty awesome to see how it would actually loop around. I mean, gosh, you could start on one end, and I was looking at your other one where it marked I next. Yeah, it's like, isn't that kind of cool? I mean, you could literally start on that south end and really connect up through different bike lanes or at least different corridors. And For those of us that live on the north end, why don't we start on the north end sometime rather than hey, the south? Hey, man, I'll... Yeah. How you come we start always wherever, start on the south end? Wherever you want to start. I'm, I'm, <laughs> well, a, per, I'm a proponent. I, I commend. I'm, I'm over here on the west side put thinking this together there's not a lot. Expert help. I needed this. It may be a no-brainer to some of you, but I needed the priority. Mm -hmm. Oh, no, priority. definitely. I just I need it from Yeah, and I you think we all yeah, benefit we from have, that. Got, right. Our next step is to adopt right. this. You right. can't just say, yeah, oh, this, great this, job, thank you. Let's start with the west side even. We don't do that very often. Let's start with the west side. This no, time. but it's there the high go. priority. <laughs> yeah, well, that's what, there's a west side. The first ones, it looks like the... Well, the, that was my point. We looks do like that, the easiest we, one to get done. We do that with all projects. Well, and we just like to, Riverside Boulevard. Get every, you know, like, every, and, then, and then we're doing it. It's going to be methodical. It's going to be deliberate. And, and there'll be no surprises. But, and we're, I don't want to send Dave Carney a mix, mixed message, but I do appreciate that on these projects, you try to hold the cost down <laughs> as much as you can, and you need direction from council. So I right. agree with you on that. We can't say, turn you loose and say, hey, fulfill these three, six, seven, eight projects, and don't worry about what it's going to cost. We worry about that. So I'm glad, keep doing that for us. And we can Yeah, decide. but don't design something until we talk about it. That's my point. Far too often. Or if we know that, you know, the paint's only going to last a year or two, right? Maybe that's something that we need to consider on some of these roads. I think they have. Anyway, which it is. Yeah, I mean, it has been being You look considered. back at Morningside yeah. Avenue and Dave and I, because I'd still, I'm not going to get into the whole four-lane road discussion, but we talked about that that's going to need repaving or repainting. So then you can make that adjustment then too. Yeah, and, and not, not to keep going on, but, you know, what you see here on the screen, you know, we... This is with our active transportation, your active transportation committee with staff. And so there's obviously more discussion to be had on what actually is high, moderate, low priorities. And, um, you know, don't consider this, like, if you don't do it exactly as this shows, it's not. The oh, we're following your plan. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we like it. All right. Thank you. Right, thanks. Charlie. Thank you so much. Charlie. There was some story on the news last night about, they, I don't think they identified it as Des Moines, but they were showing bike lanes. And it looked like it was Des Moines. You're going to say, well, what was the story about, Mr. Moore? And Mr. Moore doesn't remember at all what the story was. <laughs> oh, that's good. But they were showing pictures of bike lanes, and Bob, you might have seen that, or I don't know. There was something on the news last night about, how are we doing? You're kind of my, my uh, temperature um, monitor out there, Bob. You know, prior to the 
<laughs> Come on, up the mic, Bob. Come on up, name and address. Bobby Smith, 6005 Pineview. I would say, you know, prior to our little two block initial bike lane on Leach Avenue, we were, from all studies we could do, with League of American Cyclists and Iowa Bicycle Coalition, the largest city in the country without a bike lane that we could find. We now have that short stretch and hopefully with this year's addition on Morningside Avenue that will go a little longer. And of course the addition on Riverside Boulevard, which we didn't get a good test this last season because the work stretched out so long into the season, but people were using it. And uh, you know, lanes and even the share roads and the various, we have uh, several of us are on the active transportation committee and also we're on this study committee. And you know, there's quite a variety of types of designs as was presented in that study to accommodate the different types of roads we have. And I think it'll be a big improvement. You know, I'd like to tell you one anecdotal story. A friend of mine, his neighbor was moving and the day before his neighbor moved, he showed up with two new bikes. And he said, you know, you just got bikes, you're moving to Lincoln. He says, yeah, we're going to Lincoln and they have bike lanes down there and places to ride. And he said, well, we have trails here in Sioux City. He says, how do I get to them from my house? And so the couple said, you know, they couldn't felt they couldn't ride in Sioux City because they'd have to load their bike in a car to go someplace to ride. But going to Lincoln, they had a, a route to get to where they want to ride. And I think that's the difference and that mm -hmm. this can bring. Mm -hmm. I would say we were just chatting back there uh, as far as keeping this in mind. If on the active transportation, we are informed early enough of the roads that are planning to be done, such as Stone Park Boulevard, we could help in what you talked about, Dan, of trying to keep some of this master plan into that planning process also. Well, I think that's important. You should get our CIP book. Yeah. You should get a copy of the CIP book for the road roads that are going to be rebuilt in the next few years so you yeah. know so you can have input into that process would be my yeah. hope yeah and i think bob you're exactly right you know it's so much cheaper to do it up front mm -hmm. i think we learned that on the uh, irving jensen bridge and the special bridge we had to build because there's no sidewalk on the irving jensen bridge you know so. yeah because we saved a few bucks on the front side yeah so thank you we're going to make progress my friend with, yeah. with your help. Now, the city's making a lot of progress. Thank you. Thank you. Any citizens to be heard? Seeing none, Matthew. A little. So okay. um, we're looking for senior citizens that are willing to serve on the Senior Advisory Committee. We're obviously always looking for anybody that wants to serve on any committee, but we have a special need there. Um, so if you know anybody, that would be great. Um, the Gabriel Iglesias show um, was really, really good. I heard from a number of people that attended. Um, they sold out. What's that? The was Gabriel it was a comedian at the that? Tyson. Oh, okay. yeah, it was the sold out event. Yep. Yep. Yeah. So that went really well. We had quite a bit of traffic from that. Um, we have the budget this weekend. If anybody wants to come and see what that's like, it's a lot of fun. Um, we also have this week... Um, Wednesday at the library, 5 p.m., is the Differences Dialogue series. Um, so I would just invite anybody that would be interested in that to come out to that. Those are always very engaging, um, and they take place right in the Gleason room. Say hey, that's Wednesday? Well, that's Wednesday, Differences Dialogue, yep. It There's also really the Neighborhood good, Network good on luck. Thursday uh, at the police. Uh, yeah, we were there the last one. Wednesdays, I, I have a standing commitment with the youth group, so I'm that's really hard for me to meet on. I think that last one was on Thursday that we had about the yeah, city council. Yeah, there's two of them. Yeah. Each month. Yep. Yeah. But I'll try to make them when I can. Okay. Julie? Um, I don't have much. I do want to say the big numbers on the agenda today totaled over $4.6 million that will be spent on infrastructure. So I know people always say, when are the streets getting fixed? When is the, you know, sewers getting fixed? They're getting fixed. So the money's been dedicated and approved. Um, I also want to follow up on the activities this weekend. 
you know, downtown in the surrounding area was hopping. We had lots of people from out of town. I mean, it's great to see the city kind of perking back up again. And, you know, it brings revenue no matter what they do, staying at hotels, motels, eating out, um, buying gas at the quick stops. It doesn't matter if it's a family owned business, if it's a franchise affiliate, it brings revenue to the city. So thanks everybody for getting out there and um, really appreciate all that activity. Alex. Yeah. Um, no, I would just uh, echo one thing. I would just say, yeah, that I heard. I talked to um, Enzo today from the Tyson Event Center, just kind of getting the, his feedback, and said that it was. It seemed to go off without a hitch. That you know that the their staff was really pleased with the venue and with our operation. So um, they were excited about ticket sales and looking forward to the next show. And then the only other thing that I would say is I just wanted to recognize um, and say that I appreciate city staff. Um, I'll be meeting on Wednesday with uh, our legal team here. Um, we're inviting, I think it's 10 more <coughs> Morningside students that are interested in law school. So we're doing a rotational program where they'll get to experience a lot of different areas of law and one of them is municipal law. So we happen to have a, a couple of great attorneys um, on staff that did their undergrad at Morningside and great, great attorneys that studied elsewhere. Um, but we're excited that they're willing to share their expertise and I just wanted all of you to know that I appreciate their willingness. That's all I have, Mayor. Dan. Um, the Siouxland Home Show dates are March 3, 4, 5, and 6. That'll be at the Siouxland Expo Center. So we're looking forward to a very spectacular Siouxland Home Show this year. Just thought I'd announce that in advance so people could be ready to go and enjoy the weekend. That's all I have, Mayor. Alex, there's uh, five $1,000 scholarships available through the Northwest Iowa League of Cities. So if you have them, they need to get applications right away. I think Jessica has them. And what is, they have to, they want to go into what? Public administration or public law, public whatever. Public. Public. Going into their undergrad, or can they use it at grad school? They can or? do it both, I believe. Okay. That's good to know. I think they I think, can, right? I think so, yes. Yeah, I think they can. I'll get the applications to them for those that are in Well, and I'll talk to the, the admissions team as well. And yeah. Great. Thank you. Okay, I move we adjourn. Second. Scott? Aye. Waters? Aye. Moore? Aye. O'Kane? Aye. Janer? Aye. Thank you very much.